Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful for the opportunity that you've given us to feast on your word together. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is ignorant, all of that which is foolish, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and uh, here we are again after Labor Day. I uh, hope everyone had a great holiday, uh, some good restful time off, and some uh, maybe even some fun time. Uh, we're going to continue on in our study in 1 Corinthians. We're, uh, we've only got three chapters to go. I hope to be able to finish the 13th chapter today. Now, in our last study, uh, we reached the 8th verse of chapter 13. And uh, we've been looking at the body of Christ and, that, uh, and the fact that we are members of that body collectively we make up that body and we're one body in Christ and in the 13th chapter we were told that uh, and this is a more excellent way and the subject of the chapter uh, is love uh, the love which is the subject of the chapter never fails uh, the love never fails never ends but whether prophecies plural they shall fail and the word here uh, means to render invalid, to render uh, useless. Prophecies, they shall fail. Uh, charity never fails. It's a present tense. Uh, it never does that. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Passive voice, they shall be made to fail. Uh, whether there be tongues, plural, they shall cease by themselves. Middle voice, that's a middle voice, perfect tense, or future tense, I'm sorry, future tense. I'm looking at the grammar. They'll cease by themselves. They'll come to an end by themselves. Whether there be knowledge, it'll vanish away. That's the same word uh, translated fail. Uh, at the beginning of the verse. The same word says, knowledge shall vanish away. It's translated differently by the English translators, but it, it still means render to render invalid. Uh, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part, and uh, take note there, there's no tongues. We know in part, we prophesy in part, but tongues they shall cease by themselves. But when that which is the perfect is come, then that which is the in part will be in the future be made, and that's a passive voice, uh, to be done away, rendered inoperative. So our question here, ought to be uh, what is the in part and what is the perfect and we're going to talk about that uh, in this video so here are at least 10 views that i found in the literature about what this verse means i'll go through these 10 uh, views and uh, many teach that the perfect is the maturity of the believer now if that's true well then we no longer need those gifts uh, because, because once we become mature in the faith, but that doesn't apply to everybody because everybody's not mature. So the, the gifts must remain for the maturity of each believer so they're never going to pass away. So that doesn't seem to me, at least it doesn't seem to make sense with verse 8. And then there are those uh, 
those who believe that the perfect is when we go to be with him. But that still means that the gifts have to remain for those uh, who haven't yet gone to be with him. So, uh, well, that doesn't seem to make any sense with the context. And then there are those who believe, uh, clearly believe that this is the rapture of the church. That's, that's what we're looking forward to. And if it is the rapture of the church, and I'm not, I'm not saying it isn't, uh, it, it then means without question that these gifts must remain until the church is raptured. So they'd have to remain until the rapture of the church, and that doesn't jive with the, with the context. And then there are those uh, that believe that since the uh, subject of the chapter is love, well, we, we no longer need these gifts. So once we reach uh, this uh, true state of love, uh, these gifts no longer remain. And that may be. I'm not going to argue against that. I don't know. Uh, for those who haven't reached that perfect state of love, you know, then the gifts still have to be there, you know, for them. But to me, folks, that just doesn't seem to work. Another view that's, uh, that you'll often hear is that uh, there are those that say that, well, what this text means is that those who are living as spiritual, you know, we don't need the end part, we have the perfect, and, and the perfect means living as spiritual. And again, we have, basically, we have the same problem. Uh, that means for those who are living as carnal, the gifts, the gifts still have to be here. And that doesn't seem to fit. And then there's another view, and that is that uh, there are those who think that it's the maturity of the church that the church matured in the first century. So now we don't need those gifts. We don't need gifts uh, when they're mature. Uh, when the church was mature, they didn't need the gifts. Uh, when they're immature, they still need them. So once again, we have the same problem. The gifts haven't ceased or passed away. Uh, They suggest that, that that which is perfect means the maturity of the church at the end of the uh, apostolic age. And that uh, once we have a church established, then we don't need these gifts. Well, that's not a whole lot different than saying it's the completion of the canon at the end of the apostolic age. You know, miracles were used to uh, prove that it was God's Word, and we don't need those anymore. And the views just go on and on, folks. So there's another one that says that there are, uh, well, it's the return of Christ to establish His kingdom, because the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. However, that means all of those gifts must remain until Christ returns to establish His kingdom. And again, that doesn't seem to fit the context. And then there's another view. Uh, there are those who believe that uh, the perfect is, believe it or not, they believe that the perfect is, is A.D. 70. Tongues were assigned to Israel. You know, if you remember, the Jews require a sign. The, G, the, the Gentiles seek uh, after wisdom. So the sign to Israel uh, were tongues. And in AD 70, God finished His work with Israel. The city was destroyed. Uh, the Jews were, were scattered throughout the world. So it means uh, AD 70. So, so tongues ceased because God is no longer dealing with Israel. 
but that indicates that the other gifts must still continue. And then there's another view. And the other is the judgment at the end of the kingdom age. And once again, we have the same problem because that hasn't started yet. Well, unless you believe that we're now living in the kingdom, which, you know, I doubt you do, but there are actually some who do believe that which is a bit far-fetched. So that means all of the gifts are still here until God finishes His judgment at the end of uh, the kingdom age. And then there are those who believe that the gifts have to continue until the eternal state. That's after the thousand-year reign of Christ when the eternal state begins. Uh, Revelation chapter 21. And once again, we're faced with the fact that until the eternal state, these gifts must continue. When it says that they've ceased. Uh, now, there are those who believe the gifts have ceased, particularly the sign gifts. And as you already know, I think all of the gifts that, we're, that we, we here are dealing with in the context of uh, chapter 12 and chapter 13 have ceased. Uh, that, that doesn't make it true, folks. Please, nobody has to agree with me. These are simply the results of my study, and I urge you to study the Scriptures daily to see whether or not these things be so. There are those who loudly profess that there are no, no uh, historical scientific historical evidences that anybody is, has spoken in a language uh, that they didn't know since the first century when we had that gift at Pentecost. That there is no historical scientific proof that anybody who didn't, didn't know a language uh, has spoken in that language. And I don't know that that's true. I suspect it is. Uh, and I'm just being honest with you folks. Uh, there are many who are clearly convinced that at least tongues have ceased. And they, they talk about the, the sign gifts, the healings, and uh, things like that. I think they all ceased. I don't think that they were needed anymore. And uh, so, you know, we'll talk some more about that. Now, we read in Hebrews... This is, uh, I believe it's in the first two verses of Hebrews chapter 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. So clearly the Holy Spirit is indicating in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, that the Holy Spirit has divided God's speaking into, into two epics. And I could, I could suggest to you, may, maybe that's the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that's what I think it is. So I think that which is the perfect is a complete canon of Scripture. The completed Word of God. So let's think about that for a moment. The, uh, the word the perfect it's, is, is a neuter. The only way I can know what somebody said or meant is grammar. You know, I remember back in English uh, school, in, in grade school, I had to study grammar. I hated it. Uh, at that time, I hated it. I had to study grammar. Why? Because I need to know whether you're talking about something in the past or in the present or in the future. And folks, I don't know how to do that without grammar. I, I don't know how anybody expresses intelligent thought separate from some kind of grammatical structure. The word the perfect is a neuter. 
Now, I, I just went through at least 10 different views. There's, there's, I know there's more than that. You know, a, a maturity of the believer, that's, that's a masculine, so that doesn't seem to make sense. Uh, when we go to be with him, that's a masculine. The, uh, the rapture of the church, that's a feminine. Uh, replaced by love, that's a nominative, nominative uh, in the Greek. Uh, living as a spiritual person, not a carnal person. Uh, that, uh, that this is a date, the maturity of the local church, that's a feminine. The, re the return of Christ, well, that's a masculine. Uh, A.D. 70, uh, tongues that have ceased. Uh, for Israel, that's a nominative. Maybe that fits and maybe it doesn't. The completion of the kingdom, that's a, that's a feminine. And the eternal state, that's both a masculine and feminine. No neuter. So it seems to me that the perfect is God speaking. And I think Hebrews 1 indicates both uh, two ways in which God spoke. One by prophets and one by His Son. And the apostles were appointed by Christ to write the Word of, of, of God. I've pointed this out on several occasions. I thank God that you received the word from us as, as what it was in truth, God's word. So I believe it's the completion of the word of God. I don't believe that God has any more to say to us, folks. I don't believe anyone out there can write another book and add it to the Bible. I believe God's word is complete. Okay. It wasn't man who constructed that. It was God. And if it were speaking of a mature individual, it would be masculine. But it's neuter. And I followed that neuter through the grammar, and I become convinced it's God's speaking in His Son. We know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is the perfect has come, then the in part shall be rendered inoperative. Makes sense to me. And, and now I have to worry about the uh, in part. If the perfect is the complete Word of God, uh, is the in part the Old Testament? And is it possible to say that the Old Testament would be rendered inoperative, rendered useless? Well, of course, all, all Scripture is for us. It's just not all to us. It is possible to say that because you're not under law, you're under grace, uh, but you're not, you're not under law. Wherefore then serve the law, it was added because of the transgression until, until, listen, until what? Until Christ came. So it's rendered invalid. So there I'm saying that the Old Testament, please don't misunderstand me here, is useless because the law is invalid as far as we are concerned. Okay? Now, there are those who go on and say, well, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. So, verse 11 clearly says the perfect must be maturity. And I already discussed the fact that I don't think it's maturity. But, but if it is, that's a masculine and, and it doesn't fit the neuter. Uh, I understood as a child. I thought as a child. Look at this illustration. This is one of my I'm not, I'm not known for my illustrations, folks, but the training wheels on the bike might get the picture across. I put away those childish things. I trust you put away law, okay? Jesus Christ did fulfill the law for you. If He didn't, then this book is not true. He was made sin for you. He paid your sin debt. He met the requirements of the law so that 
the law, as far as you are concerned, is invalid. Not that you don't have responsibilities to a heavenly father. It's the question is what is is what are your responsibilities? We have a that's vast you know vastly different than the law. Uh, we have another verse, you put away childish things. We did that, okay? We see through a glass darkly, folks, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I also am known. Dearly beloved, any time that you try to evaluate God's blessings by your performance or your maturity, emotionally or, or physically, you're in trouble. He blessed you because you inherited a hundred thousand dollars? That's nothing. Somebody else inherited ten million. No no matter whatever whatever you bring up, I'll find out something better. So God didn't bless you near as much as you thought he did. You know, well, uh I was sick, uh and he made me well. Oh man, I know this person that everything in the world was wrong with him. And God healed him. You can't do that. Folks, how do you know God has blessed you? Because you, I don't know, you're rich, you're famous, you're whatever, you got every, every desire of your heart. If you don't know the answer to that, folks, you have my deepest sympathy because he said he has blessed you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That's how you know it. The only way that you know it is that. So I see through a glass darkly. That word glass there is the Greek word for a mirror. Most of you know that. And I cannot begin to imagine how many sermons that I have heard, folks, over the years that suggest that we now darkly see the Lord Jesus Christ. But when you're there with Him, now you'll see Him face to face. That's not what I see in a mirror, folks. When I look in a mirror, I see me. That's what a mirror is. You know, it reflects the image of the person that looks in it. Well, it reflects the image of Christ. It does not. It reflects my image, folks. And under the law, my image is, well, I ought to try. I ought to work. I ought to strive. I ought to serve. I ought to work. And God will bless me if I do all that. And if I don't do that, He won't bless me. You read that over and over again concerning His people in the Old Testament. What did He want you to see in the Old Testament? And that many of you are going to write to me, and, and I'm sure, and say, some of you are going to write to me and say, well, uh, you know, Steve, you've done away with the Old Testament. That law doesn't work. That's what. I'll bless you, Steve, if you serve me, if you're faithful and obey me. And what do I do? Well, I go out and I make images of God out of, out of stone and silver and gold, and I fall down and worship it. How in the world could Israel, roaming in the desert with all of God's supply, ever turn against him? <laughs> but they always did. They have done nothing which I have commanded them to do, is what he said. That's what I see darkly. But all of a sudden, I have a complete canon, a complete Bible and when I look in that mirror, I see myself as a lost sinner, as who I am, a lost sinner, despising God, not serving God, not loving God, the poison on my lips and on my tongue. But I see Christ who died for me. That I'm not blessed because of what I do or what I've done, but because of what He did. I'm not blessed because I'm obedient. I'm not blessed because I'm faithful. I'm not blessed because I serve Him. 
or, or I do all those things that those, those poor Jews didn't do in the Old Testament. Under law, I see myself as hopeless. Now I know in part. But then when the Word of God is complete, shall I know even as also I am known. It, folks, it is not that when you get to heaven, you're going to know as you're known. Okay? As you're, but it's in the Word of God that I know as I'm known. I have stressed so strongly the importance of study. You'll never know the Lord Jesus Christ if you stop reading at Malachi. You need that which is perfect so that, so that I mean, so you can see who you are. What I am is a sinner saved by grace, right? Uh, right? We love saying that. No. What you are is one clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. How does He know you? How does God know you? As holy, unblameable, unreprovable in His sight. That's how He knows you. So we now know how God sees us because we see ourselves as we truly are, the way God truly sees us. Your sins are not to be called to mind. He, he, he can't know me that way. You know, you know, look what I've done. Look at how I've lived. Look, look, look. No, 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 no. What does he say? He says, listen to him. Don't look. Listen. He sees you as holy. He sees you as unblameable. He sees you as unreprovable. You know him. He knows you. You would never, ever know that relationship. You would never know that you are in Christ, the hope of glory, that He's not ashamed to call you brother, that He loves you, that He died in your place. You would never know those things without this complete book, this completed Bible in your hand, which God used Paul to. To complete. When I look in the mirror, I'm going to see myself as He sees me. It's, it's hard for me to grasp, okay? But I am holy. I am redeemed. I am the righteousness of God in Him. Without the New Testament, without the complete canon of Scripture, you'd never know who you are. In Christ, you'd never know who you truly are. You wouldn't have a chance of knowing that. We could not know ourselves as God knows us if all we had, folks, was Genesis through Malachi. Verse 12. But now, presently, present tense, abides faith, hope, love, these three. Note that there's no knowledge, there's no prophecy, there's no tongues. And now when the perfect has come, abides faith, hope, and love, these three. And the greatest of these is the love. It's articulated. The only way that I can see myself as I see myself in God's Word, not in my own mind as a filthy, rotten sinner, but in God who sees me holy and righteous before Him. The only way that I can know that is this book, His Word. And the love of God that's been bestowed upon me. You know, uh, I'm a dispensationalist. I believe in the separation of church and the church in Israel. God has a distinct plan and purpose for both. The, the church hasn't become the new Israel. You know, uh, and there's a lot of contrasts there, folks, that you can draw between the church and Israel. You know, the church is a called out assembly of believers who've been uh, baptized into the body of Christ. You know, every member, every member of the body of Christ is redeemed. 
though there are you know multitudes of of professing uh, Christians who may not be Israel traces its origin to Abraham Isaac and Jacob you know Jacob being the, the father of the twelve tribes the church traces its origin to the day of Pentecost and that's you know in Acts chapter 2 when when believers were first placed into the body of Christ, when the church began. In God's program for Israel, His, his witnesses comprised a nation, an entire nation. Okay, uh, you, you read about that in Isaiah chapter 43. In God's program for the church, His witnesses are among all nations. That's, that's in the first chapter of Acts. Uh, God's program for Israel centered in Jerusalem. And, and it will again center in Jerusalem during the tribulation period and after the tribulation period into the kingdom. Uh, we know that from just, well, both Testaments. Uh, Old Testament, New Testament, both. God's program for His church began in Jerusalem and it an extended to the uttermost parts of the earth. Uh, the, the church is identified with the risen Christ, not with any earthly city. You know, the distinctions are dramatic. Uh, the hope of Israel was, was, was earthly centering in the establishment of the kingdom of the Messiah foretold by the prophets in a specific, very specific geographical location, the hope and, expectant, and expectancy of us, the church, the body of Christ, is heavenly. It centering in the glorious appearing of Christ to take us to heaven. Our home is the New Jerusalem. You can, you can just, you, uh, you can, uh, this is a whole entire study, these, these, these contrasts. God's purpose and program for Israel was revealed in the Old Testament. God's purpose and program for the church was not revealed in the Old Testament. No, the, don't be deceived by replacement theology. The church has not replaced Israel. Uh, and the, the contrasts go on and on and on. Now, I'm not known for my illustrations, but Sue and I, we kind of got together and we thought a little bit about this. And, and I'm, so I'll throw up this, this little uh, il illustration here that doesn't perfectly describe what I'm, what I'm really kind of trying to make a point of here. But, you know, when I was a child, I mean, me myself, I, I had to have training wheels on my bike, you know. And, but when I became a, a man, I didn't need that anymore. And that's, that's kind of, I think that's kind of what we're looking at here. Uh, I put away childish things. They, these, these, these temporary gifts, these sign gifts, they serve their purpose. They're no longer needed because we have the completed Word of God. That's it. Uh, that's the view I have to take. Uh, no one's asked to agree with me, but that's pretty much where I'm at leaving chapter 13. So we're going to head into chapter 14, Lord willing, next time. And uh, I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for all of your prayers for the direction of this ministry. Thank you for praying for, for us and for one another. We all need each other's prayers. Thank you for all of your love, your kindness, your, your comments, your support. Until next time, rest in Him. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.